panelists talking about cloud technology. And I think after this session, you'll be able to see how you can adopt it into your organization or possibly make a business case out of it. Uh, before we get into the panelists, it is my pleasure to introduce Kevin Chege to make brief introductory remarks. Kevin, over to you. Uh, thanks, Martha. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I'll make uh, just uh, some brief uh, welcome remarks about KNOG. Uh, so my name is Kevin Chege and uh, I'm based here in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, KNOG, uh, maybe you can make this bigger so you can see. Are you seeing the right screen or? Can yes, you see? we are seeing about KNOG. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. Yes. So um, KNOG is a volunteer-led community that aims to enhance uh, local technical capacity in five main areas, network operations, data services, uh, inter security, automation, and cloud. Uh, our goal is to provide a platform for knowledge sharing and capacity building. Um, you can go to our website there to see more about uh, KNOG and also uh, the team of uh, volunteers that's uh, behind KNOG. Um, so very briefly, what uh, the plan is for this year is to have monthly webinars uh, on various topics under the five tracks I've mentioned. Uh, we're also going to introduce uh, tutorials which will be more in-depth on particular topics. Uh, we are going to uh, mention that more on our WhatsApp group where we keep uh, communication. Uh, we had our first webinar on the 26th of June, and those are the brief stats there on it also network operations. And you can go to knog.org slash webinars to uh, find the slides and more about that presentation for that webinar in particular. So I uh, think I'll stop here and hand back to Martha and tell you uh, welcome. And you can join our WhatsApp group where we uh, communicate about all these events and activities that are going on. Uh, so thanks, Martha, and uh, back to you. All right. Thank you, Kevin, for making that super super brief uh, there's a whatsapp group where we communicate discuss and chat various matter things that are going on in the in the in the sector and it's not just limited to kenya it's across the globe if we will post the link on the chat in the chat and you can join us there to engage further so without further ado i want to introduce our first panelist who is Barry Apudo Masharia. And I think many who have been in the industry have interacted with him in one way or the other. Barry is currently a product manager in charge of data center and networks at iColo. He's also an established player in the ICT industry with more than 20 years experience in the field. And he has played a pivotal role in the internet exchange, um, getting it to run and has experience in various areas, uh, especially in the networking field. He's worked with internet solutions and frontier optical networks, also called phone. He has a family and is keen on building networks around the Africa, around the Africa continent. And when he's not doing networking stuff, he's playing basketball or coaching young guys. Barry, I think you are the guy to take us through data centers and co-location, and what role they play in forming the cloud technology. And maybe you can also help us bust some myths on what cloud technology is, what it is not. Okay, so Barry, over to you. Thank you. Just share my screen and put it on. So my role today was just to give you guys a glimpse of what uh, the data center business and co-location is in this country, and there have been as I call it. So my, I have a table of content that includes introduction to who I call it is, then we'll talk about what data centers are, what data centers do, the type of data centers, the connection between the DCs and the cloud, then we'll talk about why do companies move to DCs and the services being offered there, and what are the benefits are there. So just to start off, so Icolo, at Icolo we design, build and operate state of art data centers which are career neutral. We have two in the country. We have one in Mombasa that can do about 250, actually can do 250 racks. It was established in, uh, I started operation in uh, 2017, August. 
Then we have a site in Nairobi also that is currently 300 drugs that can do can do 300 drugs. It was established, started operating last year, September. So this include what, what we have there is we include cartel co-carriers, ISPs, we have few internet exchanges, we have a few of cloud providers, both locally and international sitting there. We have enterprises and we have several financial services as customers. Our data centers are highly connected hub and they provide collocation services to customer for peering, ensuring uptime and improve service delivery in terms of ICT. Some of the features within our facilities include power, security, network access, redundancy, precise cooling, white space area, which we are able to offer full rack, half rack, quarter rack, and the rest. We also have something called a private suit, which we've seen an update in, uh, for financial guys who want to do, be more independent in terms of location. As well as we do remote hands and eyes, so we have customers who are abroad and we'll send in some of the equipment and then we we'll track them up for them. But this remote hands and eyes is also charged uh, as a small fee on top of it. So as I call you, we are PCI DCI compliant. We are fully tier three. Uh, we offer security and all that in terms of what you bring into the data center. So what are really data centers? Uh, we rely on internet in almost every aspect of our life, but the most forgotten fundamental of all is, is where do they run from? That is the data center. So everything that happens in the so-called internet actually happens in a data center. A digital application such as uh, social media, financial sector, online retailers, companies, database, and all that run from a central place in a data center one way or another. Data center form a fundamental of the internet hence play a key role into social society and the digital economy. So when we talk about sectors of economy in terms of health, agriculture and logistics, so in devices and you're talking about health, we are looking at connected appliances that connect quickly to respond to health uh, situation. In agriculture, we're talking about sensors that track EG cow daily within an eating habit and logistics talk about that. When you go to software, we also have patterns to recognize uh, such as the by patient's data and determine their treatment. Uh, in terms of farming, in agriculture, we have farm management software that manage and optimize the operation of farms. In terms of logistics, when you talk about software, we talk about blockchain technology that improves the transparency and trust in transactions. And all of us have had these words of blockchain. When you look down and move to cloud in terms of health, then we're looking for intensive search on uh, data to find new cures for diseases. In terms of agriculture, we have a uh, centralized cloud applications that process data and returns information to farmers and uh, the agriculture people. Then uh, in terms of logistics, we're looking at uh, smart logistics in possible uh, 247 central to 24 hours, seven days central processing that on all non data around, around the country. If you go to data centers and you're talking about connectivity in health, so we secure the data center will be a key critical point in such that it will secure all the patient's files, access and conduct remote operations by higher quality connections. In agriculture, we'll have uh, connect via connectivity data is collected from fields and transported to the fixed broadband. In terms of logistics, we're talking about mobile broadband in trucks and vans, we have a lot of energy efficiency and on time delivery and also speed. Uh, so what do data centers do? Uh, data centers are specific rooms full of rocks. So what the picture you see there is what we call a pod. A pod would be a group of uh, rocks, about 20 rocks piled together, and then they are sealed into a container cooling. And most of you will be able to come to and visit our data center. We will be able to show you what a pod actually looks like and how it might optimize your cooling. So uh, they are built in higher availability, security, and potential efficient energy use for cooling for the server. Needs a multitude of data to be called a uh, data center. So, if you, have, if you have a building, you're building a data center and you have no access to networks, then this does not meet your purpose. So, how will your collective equipment be sticking out to the rest of the world? So, networks is a key critical point of a data center. So, what types of data centers do we have? We have two types of data centers. We have the single tenant and we have the multi tenant. The single tenant are data centers that companies, for example, banks and government service provide like the services in house. Most of them, most of you guys call them server rooms. Then you have the multi tenant which the first collocation providers in which their business facilitate other companies to enter the data space for them to do collocation. So there are two types of data centers we have. Uh, 
the connection between the Bluetooth Thunderbolt cloud and all that. So what is this cloud? What's the connectivity with the network? Uh, my simple understanding and what we try to put out is data centers are, are more than equivalent to hard drive as, as this is where all digital infrastructure comes together. They provide professional robust housing for international enterprise, for SMEs and public sector, the IT sector and the digital sector. They also the physical manifesto of what many people see as cloud services, because all the so all cloud services are sitting somewhere in a data center. Actually, your phone can also be a cloud. Uh, so why do companies move to VCs? The most important thing to understand is the power. So when we build our small rooms and call them power rooms or VCs, uh, are, we, are we guaranteeing ourselves continuous power? So if you move a business to a VC, then you're guaranteeing availability of power in terms of the financial and enterprise nights that we mentioned. In terms of cooling, there is an SLA, it comes to a cooler, we are able to give you an SLA in terms of all this. So cooling will make sure that we maintain a minimum uh, maximum temperature between 18 and 27 Celsius. We also offer you connectivity in terms of you have access to multiple providers. So, like in our data center in Mombasa, we have access to close to the general networks. But of course, people never had a visitor here and they are all there. In Nairobi, we have, uh, have about 11 networks available. So, you come there, you have access to all these networks. So, even if you use one network and you have left that network, uh, go to where you decide to move. It's as simple as getting another cross connect to another. Hi, Bali. Yes. I, I want to interject just a little bit. We Maybe you could come closer to your mic so that we can hear you. Prop, we can hear Please. you clearly. And I can, can hear someone me now? saying, I think we can hear you. Yeah. Somebody yeah, is speaking too, too fast. I'm speaking too fast. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> so I'll just go back. So when you talk about continuous power, we're talking about availability. We are able to guarantee you power in terms of, uh, like, in I call our primary source of power would be the genset, because for you to be a tier three, they say your primary source of power should be the one that you have control of. The power that you have control of, in this case, is the genset. So that's our primary source of power. Then we have the normal KPLC. We also into development, you want to go full green. So we, we actually, in the final stages of getting a, a solar panel uh, panels out to fully go green on power. So power is covered. Then we talk about cooling. When you come to a DC, cooling is guaranteed. So the headache of running your ACs in a small room and being called overnight that you failed and all that, that, that button gets out of you and it's given to the DC operator. We also guarantee connectivity to multiple providers in terms of ISPs and uh, physical data providers. So if you're looking for that uh, layer two, layer three, or that fiber connectivity, they are all available there. In terms of security, we have seven layers of security when you're moving into a data center. As we call it, we provide seven layers of security, and that will guarantee you so not anybody can access the data center as they wish, and apart from the customers are there, so your data is also protected there. So the other part that we also do is offer you the colocation space where we have rack space, we're able to come and pick and uh, pile up your, your servers and you're able to do what you want from whatever location. So why do companies move to DC again? Businesses are more and more data-driven and become dependent on digital services. These digital services transform a DC. Outsourcing IT services to a professional uh, data center makes organization more resilient to human problems and rising costs to be for Malaysia. And also look out for malicious parties in terms of if somebody wants to break into your, into your office and uh, destroy your data or steal your equipment, that we take out of you. So you only concentrate on your copy. Data centers are also optimized for accommodating this IT and cooling, connectivity, security, and, link, and links with it. For example, cloud, uh, cloud providers will be beneficiary of these services. So hence, all they need to do is run their services on a notebook about how safe my data is, how safe how, uh, my, uh, my servers getting the optimized cooling and all that. So all that is taken care of by the DC providers. So what other benefits do we see when you move into a DC? Uh, the most important part is we see reduced latency, and this is described as the amount of time to take the data between two parties. Uh, normally, it is reported into the second. So if you are today trying to connect to a service that is not available locally or in a local data center, then you notice that your response time will be longer than compared to somebody who's running the services locally. Uh, 
uh, just you know, like you know that the subject of law and governance structure within nation, the data is connected to this is a concept that has to be closely linked to data security, cloud computing, and other technologies. So you've been asked to maintain your data, like the financial data, if you countries like in Europe, you are told to maintain your data in a country of operational and all that. I've seen a lot of back and forth with some of these big cloud providers saying they don't want to post locally, they want you to run for at a location. The other thing is we also to develop a local and innovative ecosystem. This is by lowering the latency and a stronger data sovereignty, the data center market can further develop. This means that a local innovative ecosystem will emerge around the industry, generating high level competency growth in Africa. So we are looking at all that in place. So we also develop development of a data center, data, a carrier neutral collocation data center. This allows customers to manage their carrier contact in an open competition and collocation data center enable cloud services that can be be used as pay uh, can be used as 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 you pay for it. Uh, we also have the other aspect of having independent data centers. Uh, financial institution understand why independent data centers are essential. Uh, legislation sometimes reinforces that this is a requirement. We have the other aspect of smartphones being bring the need for cloud services. CPN arrive to putting their content closer to customers. Uh, connectivity improves, meaning that cloud services becomes a credible idea. And long before you know it, it is more successful career data centers that are meeting all this in a data center ecosystem as it grows. Uh, I don't know if this all makes sense. So if, if, if most of the providers or most of the, the end users do not get their services at a particular time, the first thing they normally do if you have an OP is they're telling you that their services are down. So it's normally that not the services are down, but if customers, uh, the end users are used to getting responses on their requests at a particular time and they're getting a delay of it. Most of them, most of these customers will be calling and telling you your services are actually down. It's not that the services are down, it's just because they're taking longer to get to the services. So that's why we are talking about all the other benefits of this, like the strategy, data savings and all that. I hope this makes a lot of sense to everyone. I have the last slide. But I say thank you and I ask if at all there are any questions. Also ask you to follow I call on the social media to learn more about data centers and collocation. I am done. Martha, over to you. Thank you, Barry, for that presentation. Um, I'm opening the session to Q&A. Let's post the questions in the Q&A session, section and Barry shall answer and provide clarity. If there is any specific item that he discussed in the presentation that you would want him to run through again or maybe give him a scenario that you would want him to help you with, of course, maintaining confidentiality for the organization that you work with. I'm sure he would be more than happy to help. If he cannot be able to help on this forum, then he has also provided his contacts and you can reach him offline. The open, the Q&A session, you can either post a question with your names or you can send it in as anonymous. It is perfectly okay. Right, so we have one question from David Mabiria and is asking why are foreign cloud services cheaper than local ones? Barry, that's to you. And to add on to that, what can you do to make it competitive? I think the concept of, uh, the concept of being cheaper than the local one is uh, something that needs to be addressed. Probably the setup cost for the local guys would be a little bit expensive because they're just uh, starting. But if, if most of these cloud services actually being cheap is something good. We know of a, of a few local guys who are actually way cheaper than, than the foreign ones. So I don't know who he's talked to or which, which companies approach that are saying that the, the local ones are expensive. Maybe if he brings me offline, I'll be able to introduce him to a few guys who are doing cloud computing and cloud services uh, locally and at a cheaper price. Do I plan to link I call and the ADC? Well, there are links that are already connecting both DCs because we have customers that are sitting on both data centers. 
So yes, this is already in place. Not as the two data centers in particular, but the, the customers that are sitting both PCs already have a connection in between. All right, uh, the next question, yeah, can you expound on data, on data sovereignty? Data sovereignty, this would be going in terms of uh, like financial data, you've been asked by the government that all financial records have to stay in a country. So banking guys are asked to set up uh, data, uh, DR, DR primary and, uh, and DR to be in the same country and not carry out data to the primary companies. Stuff, that's what I'm talking about, that's what I mean, that's what I mean. So the government is very clear on how which data for a particular country can go out and which one cannot go out. And this is clearly on the GDPR, uh, GDPR, GDPR. That was set up also in Europe. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's exactly what we are talking about. Okay. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, what you're saying is, uh, what you're applying for data sovereignty is more related to. The data that you keep in Kenya and more so alongside the Kenyan laws. Correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, David Babiria is happy with the response that you gave. David Ngara is asking, I'm not sure if I missed this, but you guys offer both AC and DC with full HA. If yes, please share the redundancy on both. AC and DC, yes. We do both AC and DC. We have uh, we we work on an N plus concept so that uh, any equipment that runs from our DC is has a primary and a, and, a, and a backup and a secondary. But the concept that we do, we do not wait for the we run them at the both 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 times. So we have master and slave operating at all times. So at no particular time we'll find that we maybe if it's generator. We are running one generator and the other one is idle. No, we put them at the same time and they share load across so that we know that we've covered both, both, both stuff. Okay, uh, Barry, there is a question here from uh, an anonymous attendee and he's asking well, about using... thinking of data sovereignty and uh, your domain extension is not .ke. I don't know if you're the person to give that response, but uh, uh, since you're representing ICOLO, maybe you can give us a position. Actually, our domain is hosted locally. The dot .i, dot .io is hosted locally. So dot .ke is, maybe you're talking about a representation in terms of do I have the Kenyan identity? Yes, I call the idea of having I call it means I co-locate. So if I co-locate at IO, IO domain is hosted locally for us. Okay, is there a point at which it will be I call dot .co dot .ke? We have an extension of mycolo.co.ke, icolo.com, and all that, all those things. Okay, okay. Uh, there is also another question from an anonymous attendee who's, uh, who's asking, or, or maybe presuming, maybe it's, an, it's a naive question, how does icolo compare to, say, providers like Azure, GCP, etc., uh, not on scale of operation, but services that you offer? Does, uh, like Icolo, do you offer cloud services like the others do? No, so Icolo is totally a carrier neutral data center. We do not offer cloud services because if we do what to offer cloud services, then I'll be completely directed to the customers who are already co-locating the data center. So all we offer you is the infrastructure to do, to do your cloud services. We do not offer cloud services as such. We are purely carrier neutral. Okay, all right. So Judy asked about seven layers of security. No, when I talk about seven yeah. layers of security, I'm not talking about the seven OSI model. This is totally different, not the same. Okay, so maybe you can just clarify to Jude what you're talking about. So what my seven layers of security is when you come into the data center, you have to log in a ticket. Uh, if you are uh, if you are a, if you are a customer, then you have you have a checklist of the primary gate, the secondary gate. You have uh, the, the what you call the dead zone where you have to be accompanied by an engineer into the into the white space. Then getting into your rack, you have the pod which has access. Uh, your rack is lockable. There's a key. Those are the seven layers of security that I'm talking about. And all this is visible when you come to the data center for a visit. Then we show you the layers that you passed through. Okay. Okay. 
Right. Uh, there's another question from an anonymous attendee. There's a lot of anonymous today, yeah, but it's all good. What is the difference between data centers and hosting services? Well, data centers, data center is the infrastructure itself. Hosting services are the services that run off it, like uh, guys who do domain hosting and all that. Those are the hosting services. Data centers are the infrastructure where all this sitting. Data center is actually the house. Like I said, we call it the hopper, where all the services run for. I think that's that's very important to clarify yeah, and to clarify, and just yes. yeah and, and make that clear. Yes. Um, a follow up question on uh, the standard fee for carriers from Icolo to EADC. There's a question if it is a standard fee, and I can see uh, Sajid has also just indicated Icolo does not charge termination fee for carriers. We, we, yes, we do not charge, we do not charge any fee for carriers that come into Icolo. They are free to come in at any time at no cost. Uh, we have two concepts. We have uh, the wall mount ODF and the rack mount ODF. We have two meeting rooms on both ends. So we encourage, because of our, of our concept of having an N plus one, we encourage the carriers that are coming in to have dual entries into the data center. And that's why we have the two meeting rooms sorted out. David Ngara. For any further questions, uh, Sajid is also available for cl clarification yes. and with Barry, they are both at Icolo. Uh, David Ngara asks, these questions are coming in thick and fast. David Ngara is asking, how does Icolo differentiate itself from other multi-tenant infrastructure providers like EADC? What's the differentiator? Well, the differentiator is we are carrier neutral. We accommodate all the carriers. We are not affiliated to any carrier. Uh, Anybody and anybody who has a network is 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 welcome to come and collocate at Icolo in terms of info being a network provider or a, a, a customer looking service. Okay. Yes, we do not uh, charge networks to come into Icolo. That's very clear. Okay. Somebody wants to come here visit, sure. I think anyone who, who would like to pay a visit, uh, you can contact Barry and you can organize how you would uh, make that happen. Uh, yes, I'll drop my email to, to everybody. All right. Um, any further questions? We shall pick them as we go along. Thank you, Barry, very much for engaging and for providing clarification and enlightening us about data centers and what collocation is all about and more so what Icolo offers. Uh, we can move on to our second presentation and our second presentation is by Fares Karaoke. I think most of us who have been in the industry have heard of uh, Fares for a while now. Fares is a cloud computing enthusiast, enthusiast who has been in the space for the last 15 years and Faris will take us through a presentation today to help us understand better the considerations that we should make when moving to cloud. Faris, over to you. Okay, thanks, Martha. Um, yeah, so basically my um, presentation will basically be on what you should think about when you're um, looking to move to the cloud. Um, it's it's, it's, it's a bit broad because I wasn't sure about the audience. So I'll, I'll just on a high level cover like business considerations, policy considerations and technical considerations. And I can answer specific questions um, at the end. Um, yeah, so um, I'm with Node Africa. We are a managed cloud provider. Um, yeah, and, and so I'll start with why do you move to the cloud? Um, typically the, the thinking behind it is, okay, right now many people are moving because it's nazi. Um, but there is the actual, most of the time what we've come across is that businesses move either because there's this push to transform the business or there's a specific business need. Um, like more and more, you find that CRMs are only available, um, let's say it's Salesforce or software as a service. And so you want to improve your sales. And so now you have a need that's sort of pulling you to adopt the cloud. And it's not that somebody internally is pushing. 
Um, but then you also have where internally as a business, you want to be the best um, business because today um, all businesses are effectively um, touched in one form or another by um, software. So um, the term that's used is digital transformation, but the belief is that digital transformation is a, it's not a destination, it's like an ongoing process. Um, you're constantly um, adopting technology to meet your business needs um, and you just be pragmatic about it. And when, it, when, when it comes to the cloud, the other thing that people consider is cost. I, I tend to be split on the cost factor, um, primarily because at times it's more expensive to move to the cloud. But the purpose behind moving to the cloud is to give your business agility and not necessarily to save money. Um, and I'll use an example. Um, you know, it's a bit cheeky, but at the end of the day, you know, many people can have cows at home, but it's, it, it might work out, you know, you've got your pasture then, you've got your, but you, nobody wants the pain of having to milk a cow at 5 a.m. to make the um, morning tea. And that's sort of the leverage that being able to buy your milk from the shop is the same as being able to buy your computing um, from a cloud provider. It's a utility and you don't have to think about um, literally how the milk gets made. Um, and, and what that offers businesses is the ability to focus on what, what they're good at on their core business. Because we, we've gotten to a point where computing, running your own computing yourself doesn't really give you any competitive advantages. Um, and then now the, this obvious location um, question, which is when you've decided to move to the cloud, where do you store your data? And the saying is that there's laws, the laws of physics, laws of economics, and laws of the land. So laws of physics, at the end of the day, you know, data is like traveling through a pipe over TCP IP, which is notoriously inefficient in certain ways. Um, and so, you know, you can't host your data in certain places because it just takes too long. Um, 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 the performance is problematic and depending on the sensitivity. So if it's something like a, um, a, a desktop, you'd be reticent to host it where the latency is high because then the user will be able to tell that, you know, um, I move my mouse and then there's like some time and then I finally get a response. Um, so you need the data relatively close to where you are. And that's why like people like um, Icolo do important work with making sure that the data is hosted locally so that services like voice um, and video are low latency and good for the user. Um, so, and in as much as it travels at the speed of light, it's, the speed of light is not that fast when you think about it. Um, so you'll be able to notice it's perceptible once you start moving data across the globe. Laws of economics, and somebody asked about this. Price matters at the end of the day. Um, and um, global providers tend to be cheaper um, simply because they're more negotiating power. I mean, um, for context, I don't think we have any cloud provider in Kenya who's broken the $20 million revenue mark. Um, DigitalOcean has $250 million in revenue annually, um, which is what Amazon Web Services makes in three days. Uh, so there's just a scale factor that locally we cannot meet. I mean, so if it's Amazon, they're negotiating directly with Intel um, and the hardware vendors and they just have scale and they don't buy bandwidth at the same rate we do and Google has its own undersea cables. So <laughs> you're not playing the same game. However, if you consider total cost of ownership, um, then local providers make sense because even though the sticker price is higher, because you have local connectivity, because you've got access to the local exchanges, because we have, um, you can use more bandwidth, the total cost of your cloud application might end up being lower. But I tend to think the most important consideration tends to be the laws of the land. If you're a bank in Kenya, you will have your data in Kenya because the government has said that your data must be in Kenya. And so you also need to consider that. Um, certain um, sectors in Kenya have regulations and requirements to have the data in country, and that always needs to be considered. And so the question is, where do you start? Um, my suggestion, if, if you are a company and you've got like your own in-house infrastructure at the moment, or you don't have any applications, I'm, I'd say you start by, um, you know, sort of getting a champion internally. Um, um, 
And so you, you get a champion internally, get somebody who's going to run with this, um, have them um, invest in a couple of low, um, low risk workloads that can begin to um, whet your appetite so that you can begin to have a sense of what it is to operate fully in the cloud and sort of be from a um, position of comfort. And the rule of thumb when you're trying to move one of your fast workloads to the cloud is to get something important enough that people will care about how it runs, but not so important that you get fired. Um, and so an example is you start with, um, the example we gave there the spam filter, um, which is low risk. Like the worst case scenario for that is people get more spam. Um, best case is people suddenly have no spam and they're very happy. But if you start with the ERP and that goes sideways, then you lose your job. So like, if you get fired in the process of moving to the cloud, nobody wins. Um, and, like that, that, and, and so that's just the thinking. So you just start small and, um, and grow over time. Um, and so this is I've basically covered this. And basically on top of that, you create a, a culture that allows your team members, now if you're the CIO, um, to experiment and learn. And so even though it's not necessarily optimal to have somebody say, move an application and it doesn't always work, but that freedom allows them to learn more about the cloud and allows you to start moving in a, what's, what's the right term, in a, in, in a more manageable manner. Um, and also just invest in education because ultimately the cloud is changing very, very fast. Um, and you know, Amazon, if you follow them on Twitter, have new features coming out every day and Google and all these other guys. So, you need to be constantly learning and the technical team needs to be constantly learning um, about what the latest trends are and what tools are available and that sort of thing. And then now we speak about migration. Um, and this is just a quote by Stephen Oban. Um, we've been moving our technical platforms generations. Like I cut my teeth moving people from bare metal um, workloads to you know, virtualized workloads. And you know we did that, and we thought you know once you're virtualized, you're you're, you're happy, and then suddenly everyone is moving to the cloud. And once they got to sort of um, infrastructure as a service, you now have people moving to Kubernetes, and you have people moving to software as a service. And so, these migrations to give people more agility and more flexibility will always be there. I think. Um, we just have to accept that you know systems are larger, more complicated, um, and we just improve as we go along. So it's a continuous um, process, as I said earlier. And then, like your application migration strategies, there are six broad ones. Um, uh, Rehosting is lift and shift. So this is I have a physical server in my data center. I basically move that as is, same license, same software, everything, nothing is rebuilt. Um, you've got a variety of tools, like um, Amazon has a bunch of tools, VM has a bunch of tools, everyone has a bunch of tools. And so the VM or the workload remains the same. It's just, it's, not run, it's just that it's not running in a data center, it's running in a third party cloud provider. Um, then there's replatforming, which is um, tinker and shift. And so this is, you got, you've got a bare metal server, you convert it to a virtual server or you break it apart into a, you basically take that opportunity to separate your database server and your uh, application server. And then there's repurchasing. Um, repurchasing is where you just move, like you're using Dynamics and then you decide, look, this Dynamics 365. So both are converting this Dynamics workload from um, the on-premise version to, I'll just migrate directly. And many people have done this actually with Office 365 and Google Apps. You had hosted the exchange internally, you, you forgot about it and you just moved to Google Apps or Office 365. And then there's refactoring, and this is sort of rebuilding the application to function better in the cloud. So this is using Kubernetes, even something like RBS, Amazon's database systems or Azure's database systems. And you basically rethink the application and rebuild it so that you get better utility in the cloud. Then obviously this retiring where you say, I just no longer want to run this application. And um, you just retain it and you just don't touch it at all. Um, then approaching mass migration. Mass migration is where the business is, okay, we have this data center with however many workloads. 
and you want to move all of them to the cloud, um, how, how do you go about it? And like the first thing to do is, what's the business case that's prompting the migration? Um, you know, there's, there, there are companies where, I know a particular company where the lease for the data center came to an end, and that's what sort of forced them to move to the cloud. And that sort of changes how you approach it. Others, it's you, you've got a software renewal coming up, or you've got a fundamental shift of your um, in your internal architecture that sort of gives you the opportunity, um, and that sort of gives you the basis for it gives you the timeline that you're working with. Um, then this portfolio discovery, sort of planning and figuring out um, what you have, and that's just going through everything you have. You know, I've got ten bare metal servers. I have. Um, a bunch of virtualized workloads on Hyper-V, I have all these things. How do I move those to, let's say you decide to move to Google, how do I move them? Or if I'm moving to a local provider, how do I move them? And then there's designing, validating, and designing, migrating, and validating the application. This is a bit tricky because, you know, simpler applications to move will be something that's already virtualized or already using cloud native tools. That's on the easy side of the spectrum. For people in financial institutions in particular, you have these monolithic applications built on um, risk platforms that are just crazy to migrate and you need to get the original vendor and the architect the application need to see. And that sort of, um, those are the sort of applications that are sort of more complicated and you sort of have to factor all these things in and which cloud vendor you choose it to see. And then obviously this change in the culture because the beauty about the cloud is the biggest beneficiary is, is actually the technical department because there's no value in sort of, you know, um, when I first got into tech, there was something I used to do was blowing computers because you'd never have them in a server room that was neat and well kept. And so what would happen is that you'd, your servers would constantly get a lot of dust and it was, your job to actually dust them. But when you think about it, it doesn't actually add any value um, to the business's bottom line. So today we've got people like Ecolo where you take your server there, you never have to think about it, it works perfectly. And that frees the technology department to focus on other higher order business needs like you know, figuring out um, why um, you can get into better business reporting and you can do a lot more with that leverage um, from the time you've Sort of read. Then there are a bunch of books I recommend. Um, basically, Ahead in the Cloud is the book that was written by an AWS um, product manager on just migration and um, helped, he helped me think through um, basically the business case for the cloud. Um, and then Architecting for the Cloud and the Cloud Adoption Playbook, I think a very good book for anybody who's looking to um, dive into the cloud. Um, yeah, that's that's it for me. Thank you, Faris, for yeah. that insight and yeah. also taking us back to the days when you, you used to blow the pieces and now yeah. that situation has changed thanks to Barry and other players in the market. Yeah. Right, so we shall move on to the Q and A session, yeah. and uh, Faris is willing is is ready to take on questions and provide clarity. There's a question from Komi El Elicha who's asking, "What about automation? The challenges from cloud providers in Africa?" Um, okay, I'd, I'd I'd need a bit more context, but. Um, is the question this that question cloud... came up, uh, um, I think, before we talked about the six R's. Yeah. So, is, is it, okay, just to understand, is the question why African providers are not automating? Um, I think Komi can provide clarity on, yeah. maybe you can just retype that question yeah. so that we understand um, exactly what you're asking and then Faris can be able to give a relevant answer. Yeah. Okay. So as we wait for further 
questions. Maybe, Faris, there's, there's some books that you have shared, but uh, yeah. I think the books probably, they may not be as fast and keep up with the changing technology as, as such, as much. Are there yeah. other sources that you would recommend for someone who wants to keep abreast with the technology and and basically make changes or probably keep up with um, other countries that are more established in terms of um, cloud technology? Is there a place where you can refer them to? Yeah, actually, like there are a bunch of links that you can share after we, 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 we get off. I'll just paste them in the uh, section with the panelists. But you've got quite a number of podcast resources. Um, like the, the, the book I shared, one of the books I shared was just a collection of blog posts. Um, I had in the cloud, it's a series of blog posts by this product manager. So there the are a number of resources that I can share um, that sort of have helped me keep up to speed because the rate of change is quite, um, quite high. Um, so you sort of need to um, have your finger on the pulse, so to speak. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think you can share those links and uh, um, anyone who wants to consume that information can probably save that and, and probably keep up, keep up with, with the trends. There's yeah. a question from Ezra Chibole who's asking, what's your take on real-time data replication between production and DR sites? Is it possible locally? Can Node Africa offer that for mission-critical workloads? Um, Real-time data, yeah, it, 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 it works. Um, and um, we can actually offer that we do offer it. We have clients we do this for. So yes, um, we, we, we can do that. Okay. We have a bunch of use cases. That's literally our core business. All right. And uh, to, as a follow-up to that question, there's, a, there's one from an anonymous attendee who's asking, is not Africa automated end-to-end -end for great client experience? That is ordering, payment, provision, ETC. Can you score yourself on a scale of one to 10? Okay. And if it is not 10, then why is it not 10? And maybe I can just add on to that. What are you doing to get it to 10? Okay. Um, so there, there are two questions. Um, on the automation bit, let me put it this way. Um, we focused on a different niche. We focused on enterprise. And so we realized that, you know, that leaves out the developer who just wants to log in and um, conduct sales service. But enterprise sales um, lends itself to relationship building. And so even with the larger cloud providers, you first have the customer engagement and then they consume the service. Um, it's not the same as um, targeting developers. And that's why, given that we are capital constrained, we had to be very um, careful about where our resources okay. went. And we realized that there was very little value, at least for our customers, um, when it came to automation. So there is a portal you can use once you've signed up, um, but it's not, fully automated, but, that, and, but that's because of the sort of clients that are getting. And that's, um, I would not rank us as, um, as number, no, number 10 when it comes to self-service because that's not our game. Um, when it comes to uptime, fantastic. Um, that I'd put us at, at, at 10. Um, but that's just that's that's why because our our, different, our business model is a bit different and the clients that are getting um, generally wouldn't just log in and buy the service. We generally end up having an engagement. Um, and then there's a question on the pricing model. Um, yeah. Uh, there's Raphael Mutili who's asking. Yeah. Uh, who's saying that, uh, he has two questions on the pricing model. One, how do you compare yourself with big cloud um, yeah. service providers? And yeah. the second one is assuming one has to provision a number of VMs on their own, is it possible under your platform where one doesn't yeah. have to go through the sales team? As in, can it be, can I, can I sort myself out? So there is a portal, it exists. Um, it's just that for you to get access to it, you have to go through the sales team. That's something I, I think we will have to deal with eventually. Uh, but at the moment, 
the portal is only for clients once they've signed up. Um, so I think that's a mistake on our. I'd say there seems to be demand for it, so it's something we'll look at. Um, on how we compare to glo global providers, the, the thing about it is when you look at the total cost of ownership, we're equivalent. Um, where I think um, there's a difference is when it comes to the service catalog. And I think this is something that is not immediately obvious to many people. The cloud is ultimately a software play, not a hardware play. Um, because at the end of the day, um, there are services that Amazon has that Google does not, and there are services that Google has that Amazon does not, and there are services that we will offer that the other guys won't. And when you look at um, why, which services people consume, um, I'd say pricing tends to be very secondary um, because people look at what the value is they're getting in totality. So we have customers who pay less on us because, you know, um, there's a case of a school which, because of COVID, they had all this traffic coming into their website. And because they were locally hosted, their bandwidth bill was negligible. There was, not, there was no bandwidth bill. And so for them, it's cheaper to host locally. Um, if you're a heavy bandwidth um, customer, um, doing a lot of replication, moving data back and forth, ingress and egress charges on the global providers will really, really hurt you. And we completely get rid of that. And so you'll find that it's cheaper to host that application locally, although the sticker price for compute is higher. But the complete, the aggregate cost for the customer is it's actually lower. So I'd say, um, all of these things are very subjective and that's why we fashion ourselves as consultants um, because we help you navigate this because there are customers who've come to us and we can't necessarily service them on our platform and we've had to find like a third party platform to help them with and the reality of the matter is that the future is multi-cloud um, you're going to get your mail from um, microsoft um, office 365 and you want to integrate it with this other service from google and you want to you'll be a financial institution and need to have your other data in Kenya, and you still need to help somebody to make sense of all of that. And that's the role we play. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think, uh, so, so there is one area where you will work on it and I think you will, you will yeah. update probably on the WhatsApp group um, yeah. about self-service because it seems yeah. Something it's something that 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 we take is love. We can, we we would prefer yeah. to go through it and possibly not interact uh, yeah. with sales teams. All right. There's another question from Samuel Bogwa who's asking what cloud trends should SMEs and enterprise be positioning for to leverage and to be more efficient and competitive. Um, I'd say the reality of the matter is the the, the world is. Um, moving to more of a software as a service consumption model. Um, and so if you're talking about, if I understood the question cor correctly, it's the trend that SMEs should be positioning to be more competitive. Yeah, it's, yeah. you just need to realize that you need the service and not the, you, you need the benefit from the service and you don't need everything else that comes with it. Um, and realize that software can be able to help you gain a massive um, competitive advantage. So that Mark Andreessen quote that software is eating the world is actually quite true. Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know if I've answered okay. the question correctly, um, or if it can be expounded on. Um, hybrid adoption of cloud in Kenya, I'd say it looks, many people have actually adopted the hybrid cloud. Most people tend to be running some form of hybrid. You'll have your primary data center and then you'll have DR elsewhere. That seems to be how people are moving to the cloud. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, we shall, I'll, I'll take one more question and then Farez, uh, please feel free to just reply yeah, I, I, to, yeah. to these questions so that we can also yeah. move on to the next presentation. Yeah. I'll take the last question from Anonymous, um, who's asking, do you offer uh, object-based store? For example, can I move to TB office share that has documents just a minute yeah, we, I seem we do to that. that question yeah you do that mm. all right okay so uh 
Faris, please feel free to engage with okay. the audience yeah. and, and, and provide clarity. And um, burning questions at the at, after the next presentation by Hazel, we shall discuss a little bit further. I, I know everyone has something to run to after our 90 minute webinar session. So let's allow me to jump into the third presentation. Thank you, Faris, for engaging and and being very uh, upfront and candid on, on, on areas that we also need to work on to make the experience richer. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So to our third panelist, Hazel Rashoka, who is currently the CEO of TechMind Technologies, which concentrates, uh, and her role there, she concentrates on uh, overseeing and managing customer business needs with technology solutions. Um, she manages staff to define the IT roadmaps for organizations, align technology solutions to business priorities and provide proven architecture methodology with a set of tangible customer deliverables. And prior to TechMinds, um, Hazel held the position of systems engineer and account manager for the East Africa service provider accounts at Cisco for 15 years. And um, Hazel also possesses a BSc degree in computer science from Jersey City University and um, an MSc in telecommunications management from Stevens Institute of Technology in New Jersey. She's an active CCIE with over 20 years experience. Hazel sits in the board of QED Solutions. Today, Hazel will be taking us through network optimization for cloud. If you want to reap the benefits of um, cloud technology, what kind of infrastructure and what do you need to look out for? Hazel, uh, please take us through, enlighten us, share your experiences and tell us how to do it better. Over to you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining the session. As Martha alluded to this, I'll be talking about network optimization for cloud. Um, I would also advise that this also be an optimization for any sort of network that you have, because it's good to always know what's happening in your network. So I would start with asking yourself a few questions. Do you have a clear and complete visual of what your network would look like day to day? For example, um, do you know if your network is at 10% today? Is it at 50% capacity tomorrow? It's good to know these things. And then are you um, confident that when something bad happens, you will be notified? So for example, mm -hmm. um, you don't want your users calling you. I know when Barry was presenting, he said sometimes users will call saying something is wrong. It might not even be your network, but you want to be ahead of your game where if something is wrong, you're actually, like I see Safari from alerting people and saying, we have some outage, we're working on it. So it's good to stay ahead and know when you have a problem on your network. What are you going to do when it's time to upgrade, to expand, to move, to merge or divest? If you don't already know what's existing on your current network, then when it's time to change things, it'll be really difficult to know, do you need a hardware uplift upgrade or can you just um, add some more blades, for example, to your switches? It's good to have that knowledge. And then do you have systems in place to show you when something goes wrong immediately? So your network management systems are really, really important. And also the people who manage these systems and monitor them, it's key for them to be on their toes and to see what's going, what's going wrong. And then last but not least, how will your network react during a pandemic like Corona? Corona has brought a lot of problems, not just to us humans, but also to networks. Um, companies like Netflix have said that their net network has doubled in, in, in terms of the bandwidth that they, they see. Um, Safaricom, a lot of other providers have told us that um, the network usage has really, really gone down, uh, has really, really gone up. So what is a cloud network audit or an assessment? It's a detailed report and analysis of your company's existing infrastructure, what applications you have running, what sort of network management you have, what security do you have, what processes do you have running, capacity and performance. It's amazing when we go out to do these audits, um, more than once you find that customers get really surprised at the results that you come up with. Um, either they've got some 
hardware or something of the network that they didn't even know existed. Sometimes you've got some rogue devices that were doing things in the network that people had no idea about. So it's really critical to know what's on your network. And um, application and network performance, those are really, really key things and they should be a top concern before you even think of moving to any cloud or to any sort of uh, projects that you're doing. It uh, should be top of mind, especially for managers. Cloud performance, this is really, really key. According to a recent um, CompuWare study, 73% of IT professionals believe that cloud vendors could be hiding issues about their platform or infrastructure, and these problems could affect cloud performance. So when you sign up with a provider, usually you get an SLA. It's good to follow up and make sure that you know what those SLA, what that SLA agreement um, means and make sure that you also get the details around it. So for example, there's a customer we're working with and they called us because they had a problem with their Wi-Fi. They thought it was their Wi-Fi that was acting up. But after we, we did the assessment, we discovered that actually it was not their Wi-Fi. It was the SLA that they were getting from the, um, from the ISP. They, they essentially had a shared pipe and so in the morning when they came in very early or in the evening, the bandwidth was very good. But during the day when there were many users, they would find that um, they had really, really bad performance. And they didn't know that they had shared bandwidth. So it's a good thing to keep on your toes and find out what sort of SLA agreements you have. What factors can make one optimize? Again, capacity issues. And if you want to plan for more capacity, that will make you optimize. If there are any faults um, in the network and how to identify those faults, if there's any network tuning that's needed, um, what performance requirements do you have? Nowadays, we've gotten to a point where applications are defining what type of requirements they want. So if your network is optimized, then you can know what sort of um, requirements you need to step up to. Network growth, that's huge. We see sometimes um, customers coming to us and telling us, oh, we're gonna have a conference and there'll be 2000 people. It's temporary growth for let's say a fortnight, but you need to make sure that during that period, you've catered for the growth of the number of users that will be on that network. And then failing components, you can have a software bug, you can have a hardware issue. It's really good to know uh, what these things are so that you can optimize them and fix them before your network starts breaking down. What are factors that can affect network performance? Some of these are really basic and some of these are interesting to people. So things like bandwidth, which is the, the pipe that you get, you can get the one megabit or you can get the one gigabit, but that's um, the amount of bandwidth that you have from your provider. And then there's latency, which is um, delay. There's throughput, which is the amount of data that's going through your pipe. And then jitter, the best way I can explain jitter is to give you an example. So say, Uhuru Highway is your IP network and on a certain day there are very many cars that are congesting the network. That's like a voice of IP jitter because of those cars that are now congesting that IP network. So it's said that the human um, cannot really bear a lot of jitter when it comes to voice. We get very impatient. When it comes to video at least I can wave at you and you can still see that I'm there. But when it comes to voice and you're not hearing me people get very, very patient. So it's a good thing to make sure that your network is performing well and Jitter, things like Jitter are taken care of. Lately, we're also seeing that with this um, exponential bandwidth requirements, especially from things like COVID, um, people are needing more space to add more hardware. They're needing more power. Let's say you had a, a one phase power, you're suddenly needing to go to three phase transformer. Then there's scale, there's management, there's control, there's costs as well. And with all of these things, um, you face a lot of service flexibility challenges. The bigger your network grows, the more requirements you have, it's not as flexible as you would imagine. And then again, I can't harp on this um, harder than I, than I am, but SLA agreements are really, really important to know. What is it you have with your ISP or your content provider? and are they meeting their end of the agreement? 
here are some new bandwidth requirements we're seeing, some are existing, but some are new. So the one has become the backbone for cloud-based networks. So it needs to be optimized. And when I say this, I mean that we're seeing a lot of customers who are now going directly from their home. Let's say, for example, you find that people are directly accessing applications that are on the cloud, as opposed to the traditional way where people first used to go to headquarters and then they're taken to the cloud. So things are changing. And because of these changes, you need to make sure that your cloud network is, is fully optimized. And then we have um, prioritizing network traffic for VoIP calls. Um, the new shiny car nowadays in the market is the software-defined uh, wide area network, which my next slides will get into more detail on that. And then the 24 by seven monitoring to enable full visibility of events occurring on your network. This one is so key because sometimes if you don't have a good monitoring system, somebody can even go and make a change that would cause an outage in your network. And you can't even tell who made that change, right? If somebody's got like root access and there's several people who've got this access and they go in and make a change, you can't even pinpoint who did it. So it's really good to make sure that um, you're well secured and your network is well documented to avoid such issues. So what are the advantages of a software-defined wide area network? I remember the days when I started networking, um, wide area networks were made out of frame reading. And back then, that was the only medium you could have. We had things that were called DELCs. So you had an input DELC and an output DELC, and they were very, very rigid. Um, if things didn't match, then the wire would just not work. But now with these software-defined wide area networks, you can use multiple transports. Um, you can have MPLS, you can have broadband Ethernet, you can have LTE, you can have 3G, 4G, giving you a lot of flexibility. Um, other things you can do are with SD1 is it really makes things um, easy. For example, if you have a failure, um, SD1 will figure out headquarters is down, let's reroute you to the backup site. And this can all be done automatically. Instead of having users call you and tell you, oops, there's a problem with um, your connection. You can either have redundant links or you can have one link sitting dormant and when one fails, you can move to the backup link. I always encourage people, make sure that you test your backup link because um, sometimes you can think that things will work and then when it's time to fail over, also your backup link isn't working and then there you are um, left with a big outage. A lot of clients are now removing point-to-point -point connections and they're using the SD1 cloud-based controller, which is really good because you can push down configurations. A lot of flexibility is coming with this um, way of configuring things and it's becoming more and more flexible. Last but not least, um, a cloud-focused access model is another benefit of this SD1. As I mentioned before, we're seeing a lot of clients going directly um, to, to the cloud instead of first going to headquarters and then moving on to the cloud. Improved network analytics. Again, this is really, really important, um, having this information on hand because it makes you do the necessary things you're supposed to do to make your network work well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, application, uh, network analytics has become really good because now applications can state the kind of resources they need. And once an application is intelligent enough to let you know, you can then optimize your services so that they can meet these application needs. And then network analysis, analytics will enable data mining. So for example, um, you, can, you, can, you can get the information that your response times are not as good as they're supposed to be, and you can act on it before they become further degraded. Also, you can see things like changing network traffic patterns, and that will, will tell you what, what are the new revenue generating opportunities based on all this new data that's coming in. Um, I think you can see things like Zoom. Um, there is even a new Kenyan company that started um, those kinds of calls because they're seeing this, these are very um, big revenue generating opportunities. And by having network analytics, you can tell um, there's a lot of Zoom calls going on, there's a lot of Netflix. If you want to invest in a business, 
then this is probably one of the ways to go. Analytics can also optimize network economics by knowing when and where to increase capacity. And then you can locate the best pairing routes. We're seeing a lot of IXPs pairing even more because of these bandwidth requirements that are coming up. And they can also highlight the most profitable applications. Last but not least is the real-time analytics. Um, and these will help you monitor how your network handles data flows and policy requirements. Having tighter control of the network. Um, new SDN converge, the software-defined network converge path, packet optical platforms will give you a lot of new intelligence on what your applications need. And again, if they don't know what they need, then you can um, customize your network to meet these needs. Then there's the point of centralized intelligence. Um, if you think, for example, of the way a lot of the Wi-Fi controllers work, there's central management in one location. And when you configure all your APs, you can just download if it's the software or if it's the config of the configs. It makes it very, very easy um, configuring networks that way. And also you start eliminating a lot of the human errors that can happen when somebody's configuring many different devices. Last but not least, um, the SDN capabilities extend more for programmability optical layers, and then it flattens the network architecture. If you think about traditional networking, there was a lot of uh, physical devices and you had many different layers like the access layer, the distribution layer, and the core. Things were very hierarchical and they were configured according to what layer they belong to. Now with this new software-defined networking, things can be programmed from one layer and just pushed down. And then this will give you a lot of virtualization and um, the kind of um, management that you need when you're moving to big business like cloud. So what are some of the best practices for cloud? Um, my colleagues who spoke earlier, they also mentioned about this, having a DR site. Um, as far as was talking, he mentioned what a lot of people are doing now is that they'll have their offices as a primary link and then they'll have a standby cloud um, provider being the redundant link. So if anything were to fail um, on your primary, then everything can 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 you can find everything on your redundant um, cloud provider. Have regular scheduled backups and constantly monitor them for accuracy. Earlier this year, we had one client who unfortunately had um, an issue where um, their their network. Um, the network was um, incorrectly configured. And so they had backups that were almost six months old. And so when they went to check, when their main backup failed, they went to check the, the backup that they thought was working and they found that it was actually six months old. Uh, the next thing is to ensure the devices used to connect to the cloud are malware free and have the latest OS. Can you imagine if you use a device that has malware and then it creeps to the cloud and then it now affects performance for everybody else who's on the cloud? Perform security and governance gap assessment and don't overcommit to one cloud category. For example, if you have just a private cloud, don't just be completely committed to that. Um, think of like a hybrid solution, just in case you have cloud bursting with, where you have too much data and you need it to extend to the next level. I think I'm being pinged that my 20 minutes are over. So for the next slides that are remaining, I'll ask that we share them and maybe we can go into Q&A. Is that okay or do I have more time to, to keep going? Yeah, maybe you can just run over them, maybe a minute or two. Okay. Two minutes? Um, um, yeah. Okay. I'll be really quick. So why is network optimization for cloud important? Um, because of data security, portability, resilience. Uh, you need to estimate the operational downtime you will need when you're transferring from when you're transferring to cloud. You need to understand what requirements you have for data transfer and make sure that you're moving to the right product that will meet your needs. There's nothing worse than moving and then having to retract back, right? So Here's a cloud migration checklist. Um, determine your level of migration. Pick which applications are going to cloud, like Ferris alluded to. Move something that is simple. See whether it works instead of moving everything and getting fired or bringing an outage to the network. 
find your cloud, your cloud provider, establish some KPIs, and back up your important data. Here are some cloud migration tools that you can use, AWS, Microsoft, and Google. And then what's next? Um, as our sales at TechMind, as well as at BotLab, we can help you with some of these services. Thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you, Hazel. That was a lot of information, and you have really tried to compact it into one presentation. I hope it has been impactful to our audience. And now I open the floor for questions to Hazel, which can also be on the presentations that she ran through rather fast. Okay, as we, as we wait for the questions to start pouring in, Hazel, maybe I can ask you, uh, from your presentation overall, if there is one thing that you would want the audience to carry home, mm -hmm. what would that be? Okay, that's a good question, Martha. And it probably was not even in my slides, but my colleagues mentioned it. Um, get buy-in from your users when you want to move to cloud, because guys can actually sabotage you. Um, there's a lot of fears out there about moving to cloud and people losing their jobs. So sometimes you can find that people are very resistant to that. So make sure that your employees have bought into the cloud idea, that um, you have found other things for them to do and to retool themselves to be able to handle this new cloud area. Okay. All right. Uh, I think uh, our audience are uh, probably breaking down that presentation just a little bit further and the questions will start uh, trickling in. Okay. Were there any others that were not answered from the previous section that maybe we could, as we wait for new questions? I think most of the questions have been um, taken up. Okay. So what I'll do just so that uh, in the interest of time, because you only have uh, 12 minutes to go is uh, I'll ask the audience to uh, raise, to type in any questions that they may have for any of the panelists that they, that had that they would want addressed. Instead of taking two questions, we may actually end up taking a bit more. And okay. Martha, just one other comment. Um, yes. I've seen something earlier about um, in today's world, uh, would you even bother um, having your own local data center? If I was starting a business today, I think I would just go to cloud. Why bother about the space, and the power, and the security concerns, and things like that? I think I would just um, um, purchase space from a cloud provider. Okay, all right. Uh, Kevin has also shared, uh, uh, the audience, Kevin has also shared uh, the link for the WhatsApp group where we can chat and maybe if any questions come up that are not going to be addressed in this forum, we can discuss as a community there uh, where Hazel is also participating and so is Faris and, and Barry. There are, I've seen some uh, comment from um, David Mabiria, who is um, advocating for Build Kenya uh, by Kenya and uh, is proposing perhaps um, for more Kenya and cloud services to be adopted, uh, even as we discuss, as, as we push this forward, Hazel. Okay, point taken. And also my colleague did mention Kenyan companies, so, but thank you, point noted. Okay, uh, Barry, there was a question that uh, maybe you can just uh, discuss here and we'd marked it as uh, answered, but uh, it was revolving, it, it was basically asking uh, temperatures in Mombasa are high and why is it that the disease, why not set up the disease in Mount Kenya? 
you, you see you first can by the low temperatures basically why don't you drive down your costs just like they're doing it in Iceland? You, you you already see far is smiling because far is and i were answering on the side so mm, first yes. emotion we as, as for you to start a data center business you have to look for what are your opportunities out there and the major reason all this data that people consume have to go on one outlet uh, all the landing cables are landing in Mombasa. there's no landing cable that is going to land in mount kenya region so even if you build a data center, they are going to carry it out to the rest of the world to know that you're doing something. So the, the, the number one business for us to build in Mombasa and start with Mombasa was because of the landing cables. Then with the landing cables landing, we noticed that most of the content delivery networks were coming into the country to offer their services. Most of this content delivery network would look for high-speed data connectivity. So they then approached the landing cables to carry the data to the rest of the world and anywhere else for communication. And then again, in terms of temperature, uh, we are still able to maintain the 18 to 27 degrees Celsius, even in Mombasa. And we are still within the SLA, which has never been breached. So it's not about the location where you build the data center, but do you understand the business and you have the knowledge to optimize the business? So that is why we built Mombasa in the first place, then Nairobi was the second site. So it's not about the location, it can be anywhere, but what are you looking at and who are you, what are you intending to? Uh, businesses to get into the data center. Okay. All right. So Mombasa in general was built for CDNs. Okay. To bring the content out. Mm. Yeah. All right. There's a question question here for you, uh, Hazel from Tony. And Tony is asking, do you foresee concerns with latency and bandwidth costs? from cloud providers based in offshore data centers, uh, that is Google, Amazon, etc. etc. Uh, yes and no. Um, companies like Amazon, they're actually building co-location sites here in Kenya. So that would help with that issue. And then uh, with a lot of peering that's happening with IXPs, it's um, helping with a lot of these there's a lot of added, added bandwidth latency, so it's helping with a lot of the latency as well as uh, the bandwidth issues that would be there. Um, yeah. Okay, and maybe I would I can just pin that question a little um, and bring in Fares. If um, companies like Amazon are coming to set up in Kenya, then um, what role do you play? And in line with what um, David was asking, by Kenya build Kenya by Kenya what yeah, how so, then do you position so that we yeah. we really buy Kenya the, the, the thing is um, I don't know if this is the right analogy to use mm. but you, you, you don't don't invade Russia in the winter um, just pick your battles wisely um, when it comes to cloud globally it's very difficult to compete with these hyperscalers because for many of them, this is an orthogonal business that they can afford to lose money on. Um, and you look at these large cloud providers, for all of them, they lose money on it and they don't care. Um, you know, Microsoft sunk tens of billions of dollars into Azure. Oracle and Google are competing for the heck of it. Um, what that does is it drives, it, it really breaks the economics for a local provider like us. And so mm -hmm. that's why like our sticker price on VMs tends to be higher. And you saw even the people who invented the category VMware got out of the business of building data centers and running servers themselves. But the thing is, we view ourselves more as consultants and less as cloud providers. So we realize that you need local cloud services and we'll give you that. But we also realize that you're going to have your sales force that sits with Salesforce. You need to integrate that with your mail. You need to, like you'll need somebody to orchestrate all your applications and that's what we do. And so I don't really see Amazon as a threat. Um, we are, you know, we are complementary. Um, there are workloads that make sense on Amazon. You have a cloud provider like Wasabi who has that chip storage, you know, for certain people, who need to transfer large volumes of data, I can't match the 600 shillings per TB price that they have. So I'll tell them, you know, move your data there. And then for the customers who need in-country data or for whom it makes the most sense and we can make the economics work for them, we'll help them um, locally. And 
will help them figure out their entire cloud strategy. So our role is to help people with the cloud strategy. So we don't see them as a threat per se. Okay. I, I've seen a comment, uh, uh, a chat post here that I think I should just read to, to the entire audience from Joe Marwa, who says we need to sensitize the community to appreciate local services and buy Kenya, build Kenya. Most people think that cloud services can't be locally hosted and this needs to be demystified further. And, and, and Joe, I can say that's, that's part of the reason why we're having this session today. Uptake of .ke domains also needs to be promoted. Hashtag Joe Kenick. So you can see why he's saying we, we need to promote the .ke domains. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Joe, for that. Uh, there's a question here, and maybe I can, I can give you guys each um, 30 seconds to just bring in the issue of cybersecurity, because yes, we've talked about the infrastructure, the data center, you know, the pricing, the processes there in the best practice, cybersecurity. Where does that play? It's, you know, as in not even talking about um, um, data sovereignty. What role does uh, cybersecurity play? How does it come in there? Maybe we can start with you, Hazel. Yeah, so this is really key. Make sure that um, your data and your network is, is well secured. You'll find that with a lot of these cloud companies, that is one of the things they're very clear about. They're like, this is our area of security that we handle, and this one you have to handle. Because if something happens, and you have all this, uh, let's say, malware or this attack come in, this is the part we're responsible for, and this is the part you are responsible for. So I think there's even a whole other session that can be had on some of the things that you should do to secure your network and to secure your part, so that um, if, there, if there's any sort of a cyber attack, you're, you're safe from it. And this needs to be something that you constantly do. It's not like, like this audit story we're talking about. You do it once and then in another six months, um, you know, things have become outdated. It's something that you have to stay on top of. And there's many levels, obviously, of security, right? There's, there's firewalls at your data center, there's firewalls at your gateway, there's the antivirus that you run on your computer. There's all kinds of you know, application security. It's a very, very wide topic and a very, very important one when it comes to cloud. Okay. Um, Faris? On my part, I'll just say that when it comes to the cloud, the realization just needs to be that your threat profile has changed. Um, when you have an on-premise um, environment, you know, it's as simple as just turning off the internet and your environment is safe. And, um, people tend to be very lazy in such an environment because you know all your PCs will turn off unless somebody goes out looking for you, um, you're, you're basically safe. Um, and it's sort of like the difference between living alone in a ranch in Mount Kenya where you know somebody has to work hard to find you and living in an apartment block with 200 other units, you kind of need to close your door. Um, so, the threat profile is very different. Um, you've got many more surfaces of attack. Um, you need to take um, particular care to your cybersecurity strategy. And the way the data moves across, like you integrate your mail, you integrate everything, and there's so many opportunities for people to actually compromise your environment. So what I'd say is don't, if, if you're running um, any workloads, um, whether private because nowadays like your private cloud has internet access anyway. Um, you need to engage like competent cybersecurity experts who can help you secure your environment. Um, because we've seen from, you know, all these um, companies that have had breaches of its target or I forget exactly what I think it was Equi Equifax or Equinix or something. Um, they, they, they really struggle to recover after those data breaches. So it's, um, you're, yeah, you're going to lose, if you lose data, then you know, you've lost a competitive advantage. If you expose customer data, you can end up getting fined by the EU for GDPR. You can end up um, having your customers lose confidence in you. So it's something very, very important because at the end of the day, like we are trading in data. So I get people who are um, 
focused on that. Yeah, that's it. Okay, um, Barry, I think uh, uh, Hazel and uh, Faris have conclusively uh, um, diced yeah, that issue. Yes. They actually covered, but my comment would be just to go on the same line as they do. Uh, don't let your guard down because you're moving to the cloud or you're thinking of moving to the cloud. Mm -hmm. Security starts with you. The same emphasis you put on security on your network and your hosting, it is the same emphasis you need to put on any cloud services that you're going to get. So security has to be paramount. Uh, like I said, you need to get top-notch security analysis to understand what you're doing and what are the important to people. The data breaches are going to be there. They're not, they're not stop just because you're moving to the cloud. But how do you meet, how do you to get them and how do you minimize them in the future? So they will be there. As, as you build Kenya and make Kenya great, also make Kenya great in security. Remember to close your doors. Yes. All yeah. right. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Barry. Paris and Hazel for your time today and thank you to the audience for participating and taking this forward. Um, certainly this is an area of interest um, seeing from the questions that were um, coming through. Uh, there have been questions on uh, whether these presentations will be available. Yes, we shall upload them on our website and uh, you'll find them there. Latest, um, latest would be meet next week but we aim to be very quick and efficient. Uh, we'll also send you a short survey, which we'll not do um, during this call. We will send it uh, to you on email. Please give us uh, feedback on today's webinar and what can be done better so that we improve the, the experiences. And uh, before I close, I'll just leave you with one, a few wise words from Robin Sharma. And he says, change is hard at first, it's messy in the middle and it's gorgeous at the end. We don't have a choice. We have to adapt. It's going to be hard. Don't start with, the, with what can get you fired. Start with, you know, as far as said, what is not as risky and get better at it and let's evolve. And with that, I think that's the end of our session. We look forward to having you in our next webinar, which we will share the dates. Go to what changes the only concert <laughs> Thank you all. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye.